Today, we will explore the closest pair of points problem. This isn't your typical lit code problem, but it has reportedly appeared in tech job interviews. It's a fundamental challenge in computational geometry and a prime example of divide and conquer paradigm in algorithm design. Okay, so let's formally define our problem. Given a set of endpoints in a two-dimensional plane, find a pair of points with the smallest distance between them. Um, has a lot of crucial real-world applications across various fields. In VLSI design, very large-scale integration chip design, this algorithm optimizes circuit layouts by identifying the closest components on a chip, ensuring efficient use of space while minimizing interferences. Affic controllers rely on closest pair pro algorithms to monitor aircraft proximity in real time. As for physics, closest pair problem can help identify binary star systems and analyze star clusters. Let's solve the problem now. Okay, so the most straightforward solution here would be a brute force algorithm. The idea is very simple. Let's compare every point with every other point, calculate all the distances, and keep track of the smallest one. While this is an absolutely correct algorithm and it will work well, it's incredibly inefficient, especially for larger ends or larger data sets. Okay, so let's come up with a better approach, a smarter, faster way to solve this problem together. Okay, so let's talk about a powerful algorithmic paradigm that will help us solve this problem a lot more efficiently, divide and conquer, or DAC for short. Okay, so the way this is going to work is if the problem is simple enough so that we can apply a direct solution to it or we can apply brute force, then all is good. But if the problem is not so simple, then what we're going to do is we're going to break the problem into smaller, manageable subproblems. And then we're going to solve those smaller, more manageable subproblems recursively. And then finally, we are going to merge the solutions to all the subproblems so that we will find a solution for the, for the original problem we started with. But here's a key insight. In divide and conquer, we are not just breaking down the problem. We are actually delaying solving it until it becomes ridiculously simple. We keep dividing until we reach a point where the answer is obvious or trivial to compute. This approach is particularly powerful because it allows us to achieve two things. One, simplifying complex problem into manageable pieces. Second, achieving better time complexity than brute force algorithms. Now, let's see how we can apply this strategy here. In our case, we could divide the space into half, splitting our data points into left and right subsets. We will keep dividing until we reach our base cases or the problem becomes simple enough for us to directly solve. Let's discuss our base cases now. Okay, so there are a couple of cases that we have to consider here. If we have a single point, there is no pair to consider. So there is no distance. So let's just return infinity to signify that. If there are two points, there is simply just one single distance because we can only form one single pair and we're going to return that distance as our minimum. If you have three points, it's just still going to be super easy to solve this directly because the order of the point doesn't matter. Therefore, distance from A to B is the same as distance from B to A. Therefore, we only have three distances to consider here, and we're going to take the mean. And these are all three base cases that we will consider for this problem. Now, you might wonder, why don't we consider four or five points as our base cases? Well, the truth is, the choice of where to stop recursion and switch to direct method is somehow arbitrary or often based on performance consideration. For instance, here we could easily handle four points with a direct solution by computing all six possible distances. However, we can do this uh, with, with, with larger ends. As the number of points increases, the number of distance calculation grows quadratically. At some point, it becomes 
definitely more efficient to use our divide and conquer strategy rather than the direct solution. So the choice of three as our largest base case here is a balance between simplicity and efficiency. Okay, so after solving our subproblems, what we do is we take the minimum distance from the left and compare that with the minimum distance from the right. And um, the best solution would be the minimum of these two distances. But are we done? Well, maybe the right question to ask would be, would this approach guarantee we will find the closest pair? Well, if we look closely here, we will realize that the answer is no. It's possible that one data point from the right partition forms a pair with one another data point from the left partition, and these cross-sectional pairs might become problematic for our, for our algorithm. So we have an additional set of points to actually check. Remember, the art of divide and conquer lies not just in dividing the problem into subproblems and then figuring out the base cases and then applying direct solution to uh, if the problem is small enough, but also figuring out how do we efficiently combine all the solutions and we check all the corner cases and we don't miss out any data points that might give us a more optimal solution. This is where real algorithmic ingenuity comes into the play. And this is exactly what we're going to tackle next. It turns out we don't need to look at everywhere to find this, to, to actually check for these cross-sectional pairs. All we have to do is to look at a narrow strip, which is delta wide from the center line on each side. Why is this? Because all the points that are beyond delta distance from the center line actually cannot, it's impossible for them to give us a better delta. Why is that? Because we already checked the right and the left partition and delta was the closest distance we could, we could actually find. Now, if there is possibility that these cross-sectional pairs might give us a better minimum distance, they both have to be located on, on this narrow strip. Now, you might say, but what if there are lots of points on this narrow strip and, um, and we have to check all of those. We have, a, it turns out there is an upper bound for the number of data points that can be actually on this strip. Here are some examples why we cannot have a lot of data points here. For example, we cannot have these two data points here. Also, we cannot have this pair here. Why is that? Well, we already prove that, we already showed that delta was actually the minimum distance that we found from both left and right side. So if there are such a pairs located on this strip, they are actually violating the definition of the delta. So such points cannot be located on this strip. Now, in order to understand or find an upper bound for the maximum number of data points, that can be located on this strip, what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider a narrow band on this strip, two delta by delta. So we know that the points on each side should be at least D distance from each other or delta distance from each other. So in a two delta by delta space, the maximum number of points we can actually fit into this, this space is going to be six point, one at each corner. This is a very important implication for our algorithm. This means for any points in our, in, uh, on this strip, we only need to check the next five points, of course, when they are sorted by Y coordinates, right? To find the closest pair. This insight dramatically reduces our computational time. All right, we have all we need, so let's start coding this up. First, we need a function to calculate the Euclidean distance between two points, P1 and P2, in a 2D plane. This is going to be our fundamental tool to make sense of the distance in any given pair of points. Next, we will implement our main recursive function, applying 
divide and conquer strategy. Our base cases will be solved directly. So whether we have one data point, we have two or three data points, we will directly solve them. If the problem is not simple enough or solvable directly, then what we're going to do is we're going to divide them into subproblems and further divide them. We're going to keep dividing them until we are simple enough to be tackled directly. And then finally, we combine the result to all this or the answer to all these subproblems, check for closest pair in the strip near the dividing line. Now, the strip closest function is actually where we implement our geometric insight. We start by sorting the point by their y coordinate for efficient comparison. And we, then we iterate through each point and we compare it with the next five points, or actually fewer. Five was the maximum number of points we need to check for. Finally, we first, have a wrapper function that, it, that actually prepares our data. How does it do that? Well, we start by sorting all the points based on their x coordinate, which is going to be necessary for dividing data points by half. And then it calls our main recursive function. First, in order to use our algorithm, we can simply create a list of points and we can call our wrapper function and pass those points into it. First, now let's talk about time complexity of this approach. Well, let's go piece by piece. So the direct solution requires constant amount of time um, and the, the space complexity is also going to be constant. We only have a few comparison to make and only a few variables to keep for that, um, to support that operation. Okay, so how about um, the divide part of our, our code? Well, we make two recursive call and then each time on half of the input size, this forms the basis of our recurrence relation. And then in terms of a space complexity, we actually, each recursive call adds a layer to the call stack, the maximum depth of the recursion is going to be log n as we have the input each time. Okay, how about um, the preparing the, the strip? Well, we iterate through all n points once, therefore this is going to be, the time complexity of this is going to be linear, and uh, in the worst case scenario, all points could be in this strip, so this is going to be um, space complexity is going to be O n. Now, first, what happens when we actually call the strip closest? Well, first thing is that we will be sorting based on y coordinate. So that's going to be a log n. And then there's going to be a nested loop for every single data point. We're going to look into only the next five. So this is going to be a still linear. Um, therefore, this is going to be n log n plus n or which is technically going to be simplified to n log n for the time complexity of this piece. And then the space complexity in order to actually sort based on y and then keep the sorted um, array, we're going to need um, actually n space. So the space complexity is going to be linear. And now let's put everything together, see what we have overall. So overall, the time complexity of our solution is going to be 2 t n over 2 plus n log n, which if we actually solve this by master theorem, um, it's going to turn out that the time complexity of this is going to be exactly, it's not big of all n, it, this is the exact header um, bound n log to the power of 2 or log s square of n, which is slightly faster than n log n. This is awesome. Now, the overall space complexity here also is going to be O of log n for the recursive call stack and then O n for the, um, actually for keeping uh, distorted arrays, which is also going to be linear. So that's pretty much what we have in terms of complexity. Now, uh, before we wrap up, can we further optimize our algorithm? Well, one idea would be uh, sorting all the points by both y and um, x and y coordinates at the very beginning rather than sorting them multiple times during recursive calls. Well, there's going to be pros and cons here. 
let's let's actually go through them one by one. So the first benefit of this approach would be reduce sorting operation. We sort only once for each coordinate, and then that's going to give us a little bit um, a speed up in terms of time complexity. Another very important benefit here is improve cache performance. Sorted arrays lead to more predictable memory access patterns, potentially speeding up execution on modern hardware. Okay, what's the drawback of this approach? Well, there might be some. First thing first, increase memory usage. When we now maintain two sorted lists throughout the algorithm, so that's going to double the um, the space requirement for this algorithm, and also a bit more complex initial setup. This is interesting because this optimization showcases a common theme in algorithm design: trading space for time. We're using more memory here to achieve a faster solution. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.